Hi, everybody. Welcome. It's nice to see some familiar faces. Erin, tell us about your new job. <laughs> uh, well, right now it's a fire hose. Um, what, week three, week four? Um, and I'm trying to learn the organization of the Department of Energy, or as I now affectionately refer to it, the Department of Everything. Um, it has the biggest R&D budget of any government agency, I think, um, maybe second to DOD, but uh, it is overwhelming and impressive how much stuff is happening across the department. How's that for a start, Bill? What's the definition of Arctic? Excuse me? I didn't, didn't hear you. What's the, what's the definition of Arctic? Um, well, right now, the Arctic, the the boundary, it kind of goes along the, uh, and was, this was actually designated by Eisenhower, um, I don't know how many years ago at this point, and it goes along um, the boundary of the, I believe it's the Yukon. That is the official designation, everything north of that. Um, and that's something we might try to change actually, uh, but that was news to me. I, sh I should have a, a, a more detailed answer than that, but. Um, if anyone knows that off the top of their head, that boundary, please feel free to jump in. So that excludes Southeast Alaska. We won't bother you. No, no, but I care about you. So, and I'm the director of the office. So there you go. Thank you. <laughs> I have appreciated all your communications, Bill. Thank you very much. All right, we're just waiting for people to join here. Patty, do you know, do we have our Iceland visitors online yet? I don't see them online yet, but they've been accepting the calendar invite kind of okay. as we speak, so. Okay, great. Got some familiar faces and maybe some new people. Great, good, good, good. I like your welcome slide, Patty, that's terrific. Very slick. Gotta keep you in line, Erin. <laughs> that's right, Patty's actually the one in charge. All right, it's good to see everyone joining. I'm just gonna wait just a little bit longer here. Give people a chance to get on. Welcome everybody. Hello. Since we took that holiday break for January, it's been, I think a two month hiatus here, so. And yeah. Group. Yeah. Definitely. Okay. Our number of participants is kicking up here. We'll just give it another minute and we're going to start with introductions from anyone who's new to the group. Um so if this is your first working group meeting, you can be thinking about something interesting to share with all of us. And we'll do actual topical updates after our Iceland presentation. So we'll save those for the second half, but we're gonna give our Iceland visitors the chance to go first because it's a bit later for them where they are. Uh, and we're hoping, we don't wanna keep them up any later um, than they have to be. We're really grateful for their participation today. Erin, I don't see the Iceland names on the participant list yet, but it might be the phone number that's called in. Um, okay. Um, who do we have? Well, that's a one. It's a one four oh four. Oh, you're right. I don't think that's a a foreign phone. This is a, yeah. This is Josh Bacon. I'm from SMDC. Okay. 
Thank you. Do we have, can we send a quick email to, do we have a contact for Jan Bjorn? I'm here. Oh, oh, he's here. He's here. Okay. Oh, sorry. What, who are you logged on as? Young mm -hmm. Yorn? Uh, yep. It's correct. Okay, I, I didn't see it. Oh, I see. It's, it's not in alphabetical order. Got it. Okay, well, let's kick things off here. Welcome, everybody. Uh, looks like we've got a, almost 30 folks on the call. This is our monthly Alaska Hydrogen Working Group large group meeting. Um, we took January off so everyone could recover from the holidays, but we're picking back up. Uh, full steam ahead here. Um, we've got a packed agenda today and we're going to try to get this all done in an hour and a half uh, so you can all get on to uh, your subsequent engagements. Uh, we're going to start with um, introductions for anyone who's new to the group. Um, so again, these aren't topical updates, just an introduction of who you are and your uh, affiliation um and maybe your interest in the group so super short so um i'm going to open the floor up and hopefully 10 people don't try to jump in all at once but if you are new to the group and brave enough to introduce yourself we would like to hear from you well this is uh, uh dave clue i'm with uh, micronuclear llc and we're part of the uh, ACEP. We did the uh, town hall back in uh, January on our molten salt nuclear battery. And uh, because one of the uses for our product is uh, produce hydrogen, um, it's ideal for that. Uh, I wanted to listen in on, on this uh, presentation. So that's who I am. I'm, and I'm gonna go click off my video, okay? <laughs> Thank you, David. And would you mind putting your um, contact info in the chat? Uh, and then we'll add that to our yeah. notes and other people can have that as well. Oh, yeah. I see some very polite people who have raised their hands. I'm going to go ladies first. Audrey. Hey, good morning. Can you hear me? Just give me a nod. Yeah, okay, I, was, I was having some trouble with my um, uh, microphone earlier, but my name is Audrey Alstrom. I'm the director of the Alternative Energy and Energy Efficiency Program at the Alaska Energy Authority. And um, this might be my first hydrogen working group meeting. I'm not too quite, quite sure about that. So I thought I'd give an introduction. Thank you. Welcome, Audrey. Um, Dan. Yeah, hi, Dan Gasper, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. I think this is my first meeting, but I know I've chatted with some of you about hydrogen. I helped Jamie Holiday here at PNNL with our hydrogen program. Excellent. And again, if you're new, please put your uh, contact info, email address, name in the chat uh, for the benefit of everyone here. Edward uh, Delamary. Yeah, I'm uh, Eddie Delamary. I'm the new Rural Energy Specialist um, for Tanana Cheese Conference. I work with uh, Dave Messier, so I'm here in Fairbanks, and uh, I help uh, all the TCC communities here in the interior with their energy needs. Wonderful. Welcome. Do we have anyone else who's new to the group? This is your first working group meeting. We'd love to have you introduce yourself. Everyone is friendly. This is uh, Josh Bacon. I'm a contractor for Space and Missile Defense Band in support of their climate change program. Over. It is being recorded. Okay. Great. Thank you. Oh, someone else trying to talk? Can you hear me? I can hear Brian Crowley. Yes, go ahead. I live in Oregon. I'm a wounded warrior. And for the last 17 years, I've been working on my own to develop sono fusion, super cavitation, and high speed torpedo propulsion systems for naval undersea warfare. This last year, I came up with a completely new way to harvest energy from flowing water by combining piezoelectric, static electric. Mother the result is the water explosion. So. Um, I'm going to just interrupt. Richard uh, McPherson, I think we might be getting some feedback from you. 
I wonder if you might just mute yourself real quick. Like, let's see if this helps Brian out. Uh, or maybe it's not Richard. Okay, keep going, Brian. I'm sorry. So I'm, I'm trying to, actually I did invent a machine that creates water explosion, which is uh, detonating uh, an electrical discharge into uh, an aerosol water vapor for high velocity water pumping. It's completely new. I'm working with Oregon State University right now to patent it. Okay. And did you say you're just, you're an individual entity, Brian, or are you as associated with um, a particular company or anything like that? I'm by myself. Okay. And my company's name is Paradigm Fusion. Okay. I'll put Wonderful. that in the notes below. Perfect. We appreciate that. Cord Christensen, good to see you. Yes, uh, good to be here. I'm sorry my video isn't working right now, but uh, I'm in Sitka, uh, my hometown, uh, working with the electric department. And uh, last year we were about 105% uh, hydro. So uh, very interested in what the uh, hydrogen working group is doing. And uh, we look forward to be producing some decarbonized fuel one of these days. Thank you, Court. Did you say 105% hydro? Yes. So How? <laughs> what does that mean? Well, you uh, you tell me first, what does 100% renewable or 100% hydro mean? It means that you're supplying all of your energy needs with hydroelectricity. So you are producing excess hydro? Well, so uh, that's regular power, meaning when you turn the light switch on, do you expect the light to go on or a motor to go on or whatever to go on? Uh, the electric department, city of Sitka electric department owns, operates and maintains interruptible boilers in our schools and community buildings that we turn on when we have excess generation capability. Uh, one of the requirements is that those buildings have to have a fuel oil fired boiler system there so that if we turn off at any moment, those turn back on and the building is still heated. But when we have excess power available, we sell it at a reduced cost to benefit the community. At the same time, we get a little extra revenue uh, and we treat that as excess energy, which gets us to 105%. Excellent. Thank you. That's probably and, more. To... And, and we also use that as a generation control uh, asset in that sometimes rather than turning on another hydro facility uh, or diesels, uh, we would turn the interruptible boilers off to reduce our load so that we don't have to turn diesels on or another generator on. Terrific. Thank you. I appreciate that. And it's good to see you. I've got your contact info cord, but if you could put it in the chat, that would be terrific for the rest of the group. Andrew Woods, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, group. Uh, this is Andrew Woods, Chief Engineer at Real Ice Development Company in the UK. So I'm joining quite late at night, this working group, but I'm pleased to be here. So uh, Real Ice is developing sea ice restoration um, processes for the Arctic to restore the sea ice and uh, help climate mitigation. So we're we're going to be a hydrogen user, hopefully, in Alaska, uh, Canada, etc., in the far north. Terrific. I'm going to have to Google sea ice restoration, but please put your contact info in. And I'm going to assume that anyone who isn't showing their video is having a bad hair day. So um, we will assume the worst. Any other introductions? Richard McPherson. Okay, go ahead, Richard. I'm the CEO of IO Energy Incorporated, and I've been in energy since 1963, and I'm one of the few people that has been involved in every facet of energy there is, and I look forward to hearing about hydrogen. Terrific. Terrific. Welcome to the crew. Any other introductions? If you're new to the group. We are happy to have you here, even if you're having a bad hair day. Okay. 
All right, well, without further ado, uh, today's featured uh, presenter is uh, a guest from Iceland. And we may have uh, a few others from Iceland as well. And uh, we have Jan Bjorn Skullison and Jan Bjorn, I just butchered your last name, I'm so sorry. You, you can help me out here. And he's the director of Icelandic New Energy. And uh, we're really excited to hear a little bit more about what Iceland is doing. This is a follow-up to some of our discussions last fall about, you know, potential Iceland-Alaska um, partnerships um, in this hydrogen space. So, uh, Jan Bjorn, I am going to hand it off to you. And when Jan Bjorn is done, uh, we might have uh, another colleague or two say a few words, and then we'll do roundtable updates um, from everyone on the call and get you all out of here by 1 p.m. Alaska time. So take it away. Did you see my screen? Yes, we see it. And okay. you can go into so, presentation uh, mode if you'd like, or you can just continue yeah. to do it there. Yeah, as you can see, I'm not having a hair there at all. So that's an issue. But... <laughs> But that's not the key issue here. So we're going to talk about a little bit about what we're doing here in Iceland. There has been a, this discussion about uh, cooperation uh, between uh, Iceland and uh, Alaska, which would be of a high interest to all of us. Uh, I'm going to just go relatively quickly. We will, if if anybody has questions afterwards, or or we can we can share them. But uh, I'm not going to take up too much of the of your time. So we look at the government policy. That's maybe the, the key issue. Uh, government is very, very ambitious, even more ambitious than I think they, they can accomplish. Uh, their plan is to ban uh, new registrations of all fossil fuel vehicles starting in 2030. They're going to be carbon neutral before 2040. Actually, in the new, the current government has said we're going to be fossil free by 2040. And when they say fossil free, they mean that they're not going to burn any fossil fuel on any kind of equipment in this country, meaning that all our flights, all our ships, all our cars, all our ships, everything will be powered by renewable energy. I'm not sure that we, I would fly to New York uh, 2040 in a fossil free aircraft, but let's see. They have uh, one of the part of the ambitious is to uh, finalize this roadmap. They've been planning for quite some time. It was supposed to be introduced a long time ago. <clears throat> it was delayed until 2022 and now it's been delayed again. Um, the, the, one of the reasons for the delay we know is that uh, we have one of the, the, the left greens are in, in, in uh, government and the Green Party is scared of all the new energy plants we need to have to produce all the electrofuels if we're going to have all the ships and all the aircrafts powered by electrofuels then we need to increase electric production quite a lot. There have been economic incentives for clean energy vehicles, uh, which have been extremely uh, successful. Uh, and the government is aiming uh, that 30,000 EVs will be in Iceland by 2026. And if we look at uh, the economic incentives they put in place is that they revoked uh, VAT, which is about uh, a $10,000 rebate on, on battery electric vehicles. That has meant that we are now at 17,500 zero emission vehicles, which are almost all of them battery electric, and that's 10% of the total uh, passenger vehicle fleet in the country. So you can see we have a it's the second percentage highest fleet in 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 the on the in in any other country. It's just Norway, which have more vehicles. So in 2030, the goal is to have 50% of every vehicle by zero emission, and then we are including also trucks assist vans and any kind of land transport. And uh, the government has now decided to install what is called an equipment funding grant, <clears throat> which has been introduced for larger zero emission vehicles. This is now happening all over Europe. Uh, what is the government's strategy in most of the countries is that you take the added cost or the delta between a fossil fuel vehicle and the hydrogen or a battery electric vehicle and the government gives you a fixed grant for the delta, so to reduce the in, increased capital cost of a truck. In Germany at the moment, they have 80% grant of the uh, delta, but here in Iceland, they're talking about somewhere between 40 and 60% uh, of the delta, which means that there will still be uh, 
some capital extra cost for those who are deploying zero emission trucks or, or zero emission larger vehicles. And this is for all types of, of trucks, lorries, whatever it's called. It's uh, set by 7.5 tons up to 50 tons, which is the maximum on Icelandic roads. For this, we are now in discussion with a number of truck producers uh, to deploy trucks in Iceland. Uh, there are some battery electric trucks on the way. Uh, we are in negotiations to deploy a reasonable fleet of hydrogen trucks, but that's not been confirmed yet. But uh, that's we are aiming to start deployment of hydrogen trucks by 2024. So beginning next year, we have to also complete the infrastructure for that. Here you can see actually the development of battery electric vehicles <clears throat> during the 2008 to 2022. So you can see the rapid increase. And uh, this, is, this is continuing, this path is continuing, uh, that we're seeing people buying battery electric trucks, battery electric vehicles, mainly because it's actually cheaper. The vehicle is still slightly more expensive, but the electricity is quite cheap. We have not had any price hikes like most of Europe, most of Europe has that during the war or, 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 or in the last uh, inflation issues. So energy is still relatively cheap, so it's cheap to drive a battery electric vehicle. We have, as I said before, we have similar incentives as Norway. Uh, there's no VAT. You can depreciate vehicles 100% in one year. Uh, you actually pay almost no uh, annual vehicle tax. Uh, there's a special tax system for car rentals if they buy zero emission vehicles. For companies, there's a green tax rebate if they buy uh, green vehicles or zero emission vehicles. And then we have this equipment funding grants and those who like fishing, this is me fishing on my Nexo, which is a hydrogen car last summer. So that you, you can go fishing on these cars. So they might also work in Alaska. And hydrogen is not very large in Iceland uh, at the moment. We have a electrolyzer operated at the geothermal power plant, which is a 700 kilowatt electrolyzer. Uh, we have two hydrogen refueling stations. You can see the picture to the right which is taken from the window of my car, waiting for another car being refueled. We only have about 30 fuel cell electric vehicles in operation at the moment. Uh, they're mainly funded by a European program. And this is the Hydrogen Mobility Europe program, which is one program one and program two. But what's happening in Iceland, that's that the uh, new buzzword, uh, everybody thought for quite some time that batteries would solve everything, but they realized that the we will need considerable amount of hydrogen and or other electrofuels. So the new buzzword is actually both for the government and the industry is uh, H2 or hydrogen, which is methane and Icelandic. Uh, and in that case, people are heavily also looking at methanol, ammonia and, and SAF, which stands for sustainable aviation fuel, um, which is a lot of interest in, uh, in producing some of these solutions. Uh, methanol and ammonia potentially for the fishing industry and SAF, of course, for aviation and future hydrogen for aviation. And there's an interesting dialogue going on in this country at the moment. Uh, if we start the large scale production of methanol or SAF, uh, one of the big problems is going to be uh, carbon. We're going to, we don't have sources of carbon. So actually, um, things we are trying to get rid of, we, we, we need for our production. There is a national energy fund, uh, which is providing uh, funding into uh, projects, mainly to build the infrastructure. Uh, the, the, the original goal is to replace all the fossil fuel with, with clean energy. But you have to maybe, when you hear me talking, uh, maybe I should have said at the beginning, we don't use fossil fuels for anything else than transport, meaning land transport, vehicles and trucks, uh, marine application and, and aviation. So that's something that uh, people don't realize sometimes. There's almost no industry burning fossil fuel and uh, all our heating and electricity comes from, so from geothermal and hydro. So maybe we're like some people talked about, we have 105% clean energy uh, system in the country. There's of course also a discussion to export uh, future uh, electrofuels. Uh, so we, we, you can apply for national for, to the National Energy Fund specifically for different types of projects, and uh, they're going to be putting out about $10 million uh, next month, and we assume most of it is going for infrastructure for battery electric and potentially hydrogen uh, vehicles and trucks. 
and which is this main emphasis at the moment. So on the agenda, as I mentioned before, the, the key issue is, is trucks. That's what we are searching most for. Uh, we are in dialogue, as I said before, with a number of different uh, stakeholders for the deployment of trucks. <clears throat> there are a number of companies discussing the potential of using electrofuels in marine applications. Uh, it seems that most stakeholders are most keen on ammonia as a potential fuel. Uh, there will be some um, uh, methanol production uh, put in place in Iceland not far from now, but, uh, but it seems that many are looking towards ammonia. And in a sense, it's not a key issue for Iceland whether we use ammonia or methanol. It's actually which technology becomes available and, and what is whether one or the other is more complicated infrastructure. And that's something we are and would like to learn more about. And this is, a, I think, a specific topic which we could have a joint uh, dialogue with Alaska. And that is how we, we uh, use electrofuels and zero emission technologies in our marine sector in general. Uh, we are looking at uh, both uh, the aircrafts and, and ferries. Uh, Iceland Air, which is the main airline here in Iceland, has actually signed a letter of intent with uh, Universal Hydrogen with the aim to fly domestic planes in Iceland. Well, they talk about 2026, which is almost tomorrow. Uh, but at least uh, that's the goal uh, to start flying uh, relatively soon. And they have stated that they are hoping that some of the routes domestically will be powered by hydrogen fully before 2030. And then, of course, we have the fastest growing kind of industry the, or food industry is the aquaculture. Uh, that is a very simple segment to convert the boats into uh, alternative fuels, both battery electric, but also with the different types of fuels. And tourism ships, of course, are also that's an increasing activity, whale watching and etc. And those boats are also relatively small and, and should not be complicated to, to convert to, to alternative fuels. So the main challenge, of course, is uh, I think everybody is fed up with the sentence of breaking the egg or, or the egg, chicken and the egg problem. Uh, we are currently, our main topic is to get projects of larger scale uh, in the hydrogen sector. The main issue is like one truck is nothing. You need to deploy somewhere between 20 to 100 trucks almost at the same time so that you can uh, break the egg for the infrastructure. Uh, so that, that's something that we are trying to make an agreement with, that we can bring both the stakeholders utilizing the vehicles and also the, the truck producers to the table at the same time. Uh, we've had, or I've complained a lot about in, inadequate funding. The funding situation is getting, getting better. Uh, the government has realized we're never going to meet the Paris Agreement if we don't increase funding to these projects. And they're also installing a longer term political action point. And, and we're, we're in this setting now that we don't even fear anymore about if you change people at government, uh, this environmental policy actions have not changed at all. And uh, the government is actually also then putting the industries to the, to the test and they want the industry to put sectoral goals for every single type of industry in Iceland. How can we reduce emission from agriculture, from, uh, from uh, fishing, from uh, construction, et cetera. So this is what's uh, the main issues. Uh, this is where our heat comes from, actually. This is, um, I took this picture last, no, last year option, yeah. So, but that's a different topic. So this was a very quick overview of what we are doing in Iceland. And uh, we just wanted to share that and uh, see if there is uh, interest on this topic to to work together on <clears throat> any of the projects. There are some programs. I don't know if I assume our colleague from the US Embassy is on this call. Um, and we have been discussing whether we can have some kind of a direct uh, activity together or indirect, or at least now you know what we are challenged with and where we are working. And if we can do work together, that would be ideal. Thank you, Jan Bjorn, that's terrific. And bef before we open it up to questions, um, I assume you're referring to um, Torstein uh, Masson 
as your colleague. Is that correct, Jan Bjorn? Who you might be isn't looking it, for? Isn't Artnar uh, on the call from the he, U.S. Embassy? He is traveling. Oh, okay. And, and that's why he got you to give the talk. <laughs> so uh, he is not here. But is is Torstein on the crowd on the call? Or Blommy representative? No. Are you shaking your head? No, Patty. Not that I've seen so far. Okay. Torstein, if you're here, speak up. Um, okay. We're going to assume Torstein is not here. All right. In that case, we are going to open it up for questions. Thank you so much, Jan. And I have a question to kick things off. Um, I was really intrigued by your statement that um, you don't have a source of carbon for making methanol or SAF um, since you use so much geothermal energy. Where is Iceland looking to get um, source that carbon for, for making those uh, products? Yeah. That's a tough question. Uh, the, the, the main discussion at the moment is to take it from industrial processes in Europe, like from the steel industry or whomever. There is, of course, aluminum smelters in Iceland, which emit quite a bit of CO2, but that's a very diluted uh, source, uh, which could be tapped into. There is a test plant uh, currently uh, to care for uh, carbon capture from air, uh, which is, of course, very costly and energy intensive. So we don't, we don't know if that, <clears throat> that's a uh, method forward at all, but this could actually be one of our problem. One of the problems we would be faced with, if we go the methanol in the SAF way, it's it's uh, that we would be, we could produce the hydrogen quite cheaply, and maybe the best way is to ship the hydrogen out, and and somebody else mixes the carbon in, and we get the SAF back. Uh, this is not solved yet, and that's maybe why a number of people have been looking towards ammonia uh, for the marine sector, as we don't need the carbon. Yeah, I was I was thinking, I wondered if that might tip the scales towards ammonia production instead of some of these other fuels. Um, but you definitely need carbon if you're going to make methanol or staff. So an interesting point there. Um, are there qu other questions for Jan Bjorn after this presentation? You can raise your hand or you can jump in. I have a question for Jan. Go ahead. Uh, I live here in Oregon, and you said you have a lot of geothermal there. It, here in central Oregon is the Newberry Caldera. Could be one of the world's largest untapped hydrothermal resources. They're going to conduct drilling down using a new type of drill, and I'll send you some info on LinkedIn about the new drill at it, uh, it creates a glass line, a glass liner for the borehole, and it needs no casing. So I, I think me might be interested in that, using that up there in Greenland. Okay, thank that, you, Brian. I, that, that, that could be very interesting for the people working in the geothermal sector. Thanks. Thank you. Cord. Yes. Uh, uh, John, thank you on that presentation. Uh, so for the marine sector, are you strictly looking at fuel cells with hydrogen or are you looking for ammonia as a transportation fuel for large shipping and uh, as a carbon resource? What do you do with your garbage? Well, <clears throat> I think we're looking into uh, not only fuel cells. I think we have decided to become open also for our internal combustion engines. We, if you would have asked me, you know, I, some of you have said you had been in this business for a long time. Uh, I've not been working with hydrogen for the last 23 years. And if you had asked me two years ago, I would I would have said no to an internal combustion engine. However, what we are seeing now is uh, both. Uh, non-mobile uh, machinery, we're seeing uh, trucks, we're seeing ships, all kinds of equipment coming out as an internal combustion engine. I, I know the efficiency sucks compared to batteries and even sucks compared to fuel cells, <clears throat> but the cost of the internal combustion engine is completely different from a fuel cell, which is still far too expensive. It seems to be taking longer to get the cost down. 
So we are open to internal combustion engines. Uh, ammonia is, uh, we're both looking at ammonia as a transport fuel, but also in the fishing sector itself. So uh, as a fuel for the boats actually catching the cod, uh, but also it's, it's a potential to export the fuel as ammonia to Europe or wherever uh, export might uh, happen. Okay, thank you. Dan. Do you have needs for long-term energy storage or is your hydro consistent enough that between that and the geothermal, you can balance load and demand and uh, supply? Uh, yeah, well, roughly. We are a little bit uh, uh, looking into wind at the moment. So it, it seems that there will be quite a bit of wind being built out uh, during the next uh, few years. And there, of course, you have it intermittent power, so that, 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 that might need some balancing. But in general, we are in a pretty good situation that the base load is, uh, in total, we have about 30 plus percent coming from geothermal and 70 percent coming from hydropower. So the base is, the geothermal is always running and, and we use the reservoirs to balance the load currently, but the, the increased balancing with increased wind uh, is would be a, a good thing. And then a follow-on question, if I may. Uh, Iceland is quite large with lots of people who I, I understand are either off the grid or in remote areas. How, how are you thinking about um, electricity and overall energy supply for those those remoter areas? Yeah, we we are not that remote. There is uh, locations where we don't have electricity. Uh, currently, most of, of uh, there are uh, farms which are still oil heated and oil uh, getting uh, electricity from oil, but uh, very, very few. But we have looked into projects with Greenland and the Faroe Islands, where we actually have been looking into installing wind and solar uh, to actually uh, store hydrogen and use fuel cells for the smaller farms or villages. And those are very in interesting concepts. Similar setup we've been thinking about in Iceland as a backup power system. So we have a number of data centers running in this country, uh, buying all our uh, or some of our cheap electricity. And those data centers are all with diesel backups. So we're looking at now powering them with uh, hydrogen backup. Okay. Thank you. Bill Lady. Hello, John. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, okay. perfectly. Great. Great. Thank you. I have three things to report. I was on a webinar just a couple hours ago with Rocky Mountain Institute, where they were talking about the ports particularly, and the opportunity to use both ammonia and ethanol, uh, methanol, sorry, as uh, fuels, Maersk has apparently chosen methanol in the short term because the NH3 engines aren't quite ready yet, but also because to make methanol, you need CO2. And that's going to make a difference in where the plants are located and how you pipeline the fuel. Do you run into the same situation there? And also our uh, geothermal regime is quite different from yours here in North America. We may be on the cusp here of being able to bore deep enough, cheap enough to access deep, hot, dry rock geothermal. And if so, profitably bring uh, energy to market to the surface anywhere on Earth because it's ubiquitous, not the fortunate uh, situation you have there. So what do you think of those two uh, items? Thank you. Yeah, as I say, if we start with the Maersk, it's it's a very. This is something we follow quite care, carefully. They're building this eight uh, methanol uh, ships, which are sixteen thousand uh, container uh, ships. So they are massive ships, and they need a considerable amount of 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 fuel. And they decided to go for methanol because they said the planet can't wait. We just have to start now, and the ammonia engines weren't there. And they are still talking that ammonia will be the main fuel for them in the future um, because of the CO2 issue. Uh, so the, that's at least, that's what they still say. 
we're going to see their first ships coming out soon and we're following carefully uh, what their engine research and the engine uh, work because many of the uh, engine manufacturers here in Scandinavia are now looking into methanol as, an, uh, as because there are already customers waiting for these engines. Um, so th I think the main reason why we are looking more and more towards ammonia is mainly because of the carbon problem. And we have to think about if we're going to produce as SAF fuel, uh, we will need all the carbon for SAF. We can, it's unlikely that we'll fly on, on, on ammonia. Uh, regarding the, the geothermal, I, 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 I'm not going to comment too much because I'm not the expert on geothermal. I think I'm, I'm trying to be in on the fuel side and somebody else drills for my for the energy and gets the energy to me. I just want to find something to, to use the, the energy for. That's great. Thanks very much. I'll uh, put my contact in the chat. There should be a recording of this seminar webinar with uh, RMI ports and uh, uh, fuels that happened today. It was quite good. I'll be glad to uh, alert people to it so they can tune in and see it as well. It was an hour long. Thanks very much. Thank you. Other questions, or thank you, Bill. Other questions for Jan Bjorn? Bill, go ahead. Uh, the other bill, another bill. <laughs> bill Stom, did you have your hand up? I did, and I didn't unmute my mic. I apologize. Thank you for that presentation. I was a little curious about the infrastructure. You had a picture of one electrolyzer in, uh, I imagine that's in Reykjavik. Are there other locations that have electrolyzers how many hydrogen filling stations are there and are, are they outside the city at all yeah like i said there's only two hydrogen refueling station and one oh. electrolyzer and that's a very weak system and uh, this is uh, just due to that you need a larger volume of vehicles uh, there is one uh, station in Reykjavik one station in Keflavik which is about 25 kilometers apart Keflavik is where the international airport is so they're not even side by side. So if one of them fails, you have to drive 25 kilometers to get fuel, which for maybe Americans is nothing, but for a Euro for a Icelanders that's anno annoying. Um, so this is a very weak and unsustainable system, uh, and it seems that it will be difficult to get people to build more until we see a fleet coming out. And there are only two ways of getting a fleet out in my mind. That's either taxis or we're getting into uh, larger vehicles or trucks. And this is what we're seeing now in, in Europe. Uh, in Denmark, the main uh, new taxi is a hydrogen one. There are, uh, I think now, over 300 taxis in Paris, Paris on hydrogen. There's a taxi company in Lyon, in Milano. Uh, they've all set up taxi programs with uh, hydrogen taxis. And this seems to be uh, throwing the battery electric vehicle out of that market. So that's a niche market which uh, gives the opportunity to operate the vehicles 24-7 without waiting for the charging of, of a battery electric vehicle. So as long as you don't get uh, some fleet uh, deployed, uh, it's going to be difficult. And still in Iceland, we have a lot of people who think we can solve everything with battery electric solutions. Okay. Thank you. Dan, I see your hand up again. Go ahead. Sorry, I'm very curious. Lots of questions. Uh, thank you, Jan Bjorn. Um, you talked about a little bit about a future need to balance uh, to balance electricity supply and demand. One option that I know lots of places are looking at are uh, hydrogen turbines. Um, so that you, you said that you're now open potentially to hydrogen internal combustion engine. You know, another uh, a much cheaper kind of early adoption approach for large scale power production, which is also large, large scale offtake for hydrogen producers is hydrogen turbines. Um, are, is that in future utility planning or in a kind of demonstration uh, planning in Iceland or is there an opportunity there that uh, for yeah. that kind of application? I think that the opportunity is, is rather coming online now. I think uh, like if, if somebody would have consulted with me a few years ago, I wouldn't have a lot of beliefs in the internal combustion engine and and the hydrogen turbines. So so that's something that is is kind of new and, and 
maybe it's a result of a, the disappointment that the cost of the fuel cell has not come down as as, as fast as we hoped for. So definitely, I think internal combustion turbines could be used in also in funding. So if you go to places, remote places like in neighboring islands, uh, this could be a very simple solution, even though it's less efficient, but it's far less costly and therefore you could deploy it much faster than waiting for a fuel cell system. But um, when the fuel cell system comes online, you can always uh, replace it with uh, with uh, more efficient. There was one question asked earlier about the garbage. We what we do with the garbage today? Uh, most of the gar garbage we do is 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 exported. Actually, we export all our paper and plastics to Europe for for recycling. Um, the rest we actually do into landfill sites, and the landfill sites are used to make methane, and uh, we gasify. The, the land uh, through the landfill sites and that's uh, so we have now some methane vehicles in plant for methane uh, and that's also a potential source for for utilizing on ships but we don't throw that much garbage but that's the that's the situation with garbage here okay thank you mm. hey. Was there another question for Jan Bjorn? Okay. Great. Well, I will, and I don't see any in the chat here. Um, one thing I might ask you, Jan Bjorn, to wrap things up is given some of these questions, given what you've, what you might know about Alaska, or even what you don't know about Alaska. Um, what do you see as Iceland's sort of priority um, partnership needs with regard to hydrogen in general, and, and maybe even with respect to um, Alaska? That's a tough question. It's, it's, uh, what we have learned through all the work is that when you share uh, learning, uh, that's a vital thing. And it's also, uh, you need to have counterparts doing similar work as you do to, to compare the work you're doing. Uh, there is a lot of interest uh, from our location to work closer with our Arctic friends. There's a lot of problems in the Arctic and, and uh, they, they have not gone down with, with the current situation in the world. Um, and there is a, there's an increased talk. We are doing more and more work together with Northern Norway, with the uh, Faroe Islands, with Greenland to share knowledge from our work and to get knowledge from what they are doing. So there's a slight difference in what we're doing and where the main emphasis is. But for example, here in the Arctic, uh, for you and us, uh, remote areas is of high interest and to make themselves sufficient with energy must be a, a key priority. And when we look at some of the places, uh, when we did some work with uh, Nalcor Energy in Newfoundland and Labrador, we realize that some of these communities, they fly in diesel with helicopters. And this is one of the most expensive electrons uh, I could find. And uh, if you want to, even though you have quite expensive hydrogen systems, you can install today wind farms and solar cells in these remote areas. And you could store hydrogen and make these uh, places uh, self-sufficient mm -hmm. with energy instead of flying uh, fuel on helicopters to these places. Uh, we always thought, and I was scared a little bit about the maintenance and the uh, training demands for fuel cell technologies and etc. But if we start this out with uh, with turbines or internal combustion engines, they do the same maintenance as any other uh, equipment. So it's not very complex to put in. <clears throat> Electrolyzers are quite well known and storage of hydrogen is reasonably well known. So making examples of, uh, of pure communities which are self-sufficient with energy is, is a beautiful picture, which we would like to, to participate in understanding. And then you are heavily re uh, reliant on fishing and fisheries, which is something we need to get from fossil fuels one day. And we are hoping to build <clears throat> ships soon, uh, which are using uh, renewable energy. And, and this is something maybe you could learn from us.
Sorry, I'm muted. Thank you. Bill, lady, did you have a um, response to that? Yes, please say more about our differences and similarities in fishing fleets. Particularly, there's an acceptance of uh, ammonia as a refrigerant on some uh, sizes of ships, uh, recognizing fully the toxicity problem of it. Do you know if there are any uh, crackers coming on the market by which ammonia fuel stored as a liquid aboard the ship might be easily, safely, economically trans uh, uh, cracked to make hydrogen for fuel cell uh, electric propulsion and just put the N2 back in the atmosphere when it came from, where it came from. Thank you. No, if I would have known, we were we would already have started here. Uh, the, the, the view currently, which uh, seems to be the current, the, the mainstream view is that we start with uh, not cracking the ammonia, just burning the ammonia in engines. This discussion about toxicity is quite high at the moment. Uh, a lot of people who work on large fishing vessels, uh, they are not very keen on having a full ship of ammonia as fuel. They already know the smell of it and the, the toxicity of it. Uh, so if you fill their ship up with ammonia, uh, that's some, there's quite a bit of safety concern and, and, and uh, which needs to be overcome. So when we do the first project, it's very important that we share the learning, uh, both if something goes wrong and also if something goes well, and we can share the, the social acceptance on board ships if they're actually full of ammonia rather than being filled with diesel fuel. So those are issues which uh, we're looking into. And uh, as I say, I don't know of a cracker yet with uh, making it into, into hydrogen, uh, but uh, we are hopefully seeing the first uh, engines coming out, which can easily burn and, 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 and are sizable for a typical trawler. And this is what we are seeking at the moment. But economically, sorry, those are still, uh, yeah. When I'm selling this to my fishing uh, fishermen, we are still at the stage that we're telling them that this will be more costly than the current fossil fuel mm -hmm. solution. But we're also hoping that uh, people will pay slightly more for a green, uh, sorry for the language, for green fish, which is not a good word, but for a fish that's caught with no fossil fuel. One, one more question, if, uh, one more question, if I might. Uh, what if we store the liquid ammonia uh, above decks on the top of the ship? So if there is a leak, it's gonna go into the atmosphere and not gather where the people are. I think of that particularly for the container ships where they only have a, a crew of 20 people and they live in that castle up above the, the hull, even if there's ammonia in the hull and it fills up the hull, they can just go stand outside for a while. <laughs> but, but you can't do <laughs> yeah, that. The, the, Thank you. The, the, the storage issue is of course being looked at by for TNV and others. And, and we're seeing now the first ships being developed we see, for example, a ferry now being launched in Norway, which has liquid hydrogen on board. And they decided to store the liquid hydrogen tanks and containers on the upper deck of the ship. So it's a ferry, it's a car ferry between fjords. Uh, so uh, they don't, don't put any of the liquid hydrogen below deck at the moment just for uh, the social issues. They, they don't fear that that will not be allowed. They just want to uh, have it like this in the, in the beginning. And, and we're seeing some of the methanol uh, tanks coming into some of the ships uh, uh, on top of the deck, not under the deck. But people are currently mixing these all together. So you're seeing um, uh, a hybrid methanol diesel ship coming online. That's kind of the, the, the first trend that seems that you have engines that can burn both. And that maybe is a safety issue for if, you, if you're coming into a harbor where they don't service methanol, you can still take diesel. Okay. Thank you, Jan Bjorn, and thank you, Bill, for those follow-up questions. Any other thoughts from anyone on the call about um, partnership opportunities between Iceland and Alaska? Um, we've heard a little bit about remote communities um, and fishing and fisheries and uh, marine vessels. Um, anything else that occurs to folks here, and then we're going to move on to updates. I think any feedback later on would be great. Um, thank you for 
giving me the opportunity to, to tell you a little bit about what we are trying to achieve here. I sincerely hope we can do something together in the near future. I'll, I'll come back. Maybe we could have a, a smaller group meeting for any further discussion. And uh, I at least will we'll, uh, connect to my colleagues in the, the embassy and, and see uh, which pathways they foresee as, as a pathway forward. But thank you very much for your attention. It was a great meeting all of you. Thank you, Jan Bjorn. And Jan Bjorn, would you mind sharing your contact info in the chat as well for people to follow up? Um, yep. We really appreciate your presentation. Thank you for staying up. Um, feel free to drop off after this and get some sleep. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. We know it's late for you. It's, it's, it's only nine o'clock. Oh, okay. Sorry. Well, that's my bedtime. So um, that's late for me. Uh, but I might just be uh, an early to bed, early to riser type. All right, well, thank you so much. That was a great presentation and uh, stimulating discussion. Uh, we are going to move into um, our updates. Um, I think in terms of Alaska-Iceland collaborations, we've, we've covered that in enough detail for today. Um, we have some other, uh, we're calling them committees or, or breakout topics that we focused on in past working group meetings. Um, I will take a stab at, um, an update on the state roadmap process, and then we'll move into some of the other areas that we have. And uh, just for those, for the other areas, you know, we're just looking for verbal updates. Um, I hope no one's shocked, uh, and, and certainly no presentations are re required today. Uh, this is the informal part of our meeting. So with regard to the state roadmap, um, we've had a lot of activity. There's been a roadmap subcommittee group. And for those who are interested in, in being a part of that, um, tag yourself in the chat or contact Patty um, separately and we'll plug you into that. Um, we're having a series of meetings with the roadmap subcommittee um, to work on um, uh, end use potential for hydrogen in Alaska, as well as production and storage and delivery. And the goal of those meetings is to generate some ideas and a starting point that we will bring to this larger group. Um, I'm hoping later in March or in early April um, for everyone's input and then maybe even to a larger you know, public forum after that. Um, we're aiming to have a draft of something done by the Alaska Sustainable Energy Conference at the end of May. We'll see if we can pull that off. Um, I'm also working closely with a couple of folks at NREL, Levi Kilcher and Masha Koleva, as well as um, Vince Neary at Sandia and some of his colleagues to uh, baseline some numbers, you know, in terms of our current energy exports, those of course are crude oil, um, you know, our current energy usage in state, projected uh, demand globally for hydrogen, all things that we can use to sort of bracket and scale um, the, the sizes of, of the needs and the supplies um, that might be required in the future as we think about, uh, you know, how hydrogen might fit into our ecosystem in Alaska. So again, those discussions are underway. It's been a lively group um, and I've appreciated everyone's contributions. Um, are there any further questions or, or contributions uh, about the roadmap process um, from anyone who's been involved in that that I've forgotten to, to mention, either from Patty or, or others who have been involved in that? Okay, I'm gonna take the silence as a concurrence with everything I've said. And now we will move on to um, hydrogen fuel charging stations for the next Arctic Road Rally. Tim, can I put you on the spot for any updates or uh, questions for the group that might be helpful in your quest to pull that all together? Sure, can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Oh, thanks. I just had to switch to my phone. Um, yes, thanks. And for the Arctic Road Rally, uh, very briefly for folks who haven't heard about that, it's an electric vehicle technology demonstration. We're having the next one this coming July, July 28th through August 1st, and uh, putting a backbone of traditional electric vehicle charging in, as well as hoping to use this as a place and a time to do some demonstration of innovative charging of electric vehicles. One of those types of technologies could be EV 
uh, charging solutions powered essentially by hydrogen fuel cells um, or other alternative uh, fuel types or energy storage types uh, that is lower carbon than, say, a diesel generator. And for the hydrogen piece of that, uh, you know, still working with vendors, um, the two of the three that we've been talking with have basically let me know that their hydrogen fuel cell component of their uh, innovative charging uh, will not be ready for this year. Uh, so that could be something for those two vendors to look at for future years. Uh, that third one, we're still in discussion with to see uh, what might be available. Uh, and this is a group that has uh, a little bit more maturity, has more, more uh, products that are out there that have been out there for demonstration. So we're keeping our fingers crossed that we can coordinate the logistics at that particular uh, unit for hydrogen fuel, um, fuel cell charging station up in Alaska for the rally. Happy to take any thoughts or questions though. Thank you, Tim. Where would uh, the hydrogen fuel cell charging station be placed in the rally route? Can you share that? Uh, we would likely target the two spots that we are uh, reliant on diesel generators. Uh, this would be either the seven mile camp that is a DOT uh, maintenance facility, uh, that's seven miles north of the Yukon River, or in Coldfoot, uh, as folks who've driven that road know, uh, the Coldfoot camp has a diesel generator there. Um, ideally, we wanna switch onto another type of power source that is lower carbon for, uh, for charging those EVs compared to the diesels that are, that are the incumbent generators that are there. Okay, great. Cor, did you wanna add something there? No. I heard you make a noise. Okay, I don't think so. Um, any questions for Tim or Tim, do you have any questions for the group? Any needs that um, to put out to the crew? Uh, one question that I think I raised in the prior meeting was around uh, the potential fuel source. If we're talking about you know hydrogen as one of these fuel sources, um, as we've poked around the state a little bit, uh, the source of hydrogen uh, has been a bit of a challenge. So if folks do have leads um, for certainly you know, hydrogen produced in state, uh, please let me know. Um, and I see, Mike, you've got a hand up. Maybe you've got an answer for me. Well, I was just going to say, Tim, that uh, you know, if the Delta Wind Farm can be any help whatsoever, we, we make a little bit of electricity there. And uh, we'd be more than willing to uh, throw in on this. I don't know how we could connect it, but we certainly have green energy. Uh, we produce uh, about 4 million kilowatt hours a year off of uh, three wind turbines. And we've got a, a, a man camp and a, and a 10,000 square foot garage. So uh, anything we can do to help you out with uh, any of that, we'd be happy to do that. Excellent. Well, I'll, I'll keep that in mind. Obviously, we're just a little bit off the route there uh, that we've chosen between Fairbanks and Electric Point, but uh, that, that doesn't necessarily close all doors. So I'll keep this in mind and maybe we can well, make I was thinking, in there. I was thinking maybe uh, mainly if you if you had a, if you wanted to make hydrogen at the wind farm and then truck it, that might be an option. See, we can get... Uh, Bill uh, Bill's electrolyzer up there and connect it in, and maybe that's that what I'm saying. Work. Yeah, if you wanted if you wanted to make the yeah. hydrogen at the wind farm, you could do that. So, just well, an idea. Bill, maybe I'll pivot back to you uh, offline to see if uh, if that unit is still available and uh, if there's a chance that that could be brought up from the lower 48 location. Okay. Thanks, Mike. All right. Fun to see these dots being connected. Any further questions or? Uh, Advice for Tim. Okay. Thank you so much for that update, Tim. Um, it's exciting to hear. And thanks also for those dates. I heard July 28th through August 1st. So people can pin that on their calendars. Um, and it sounds like it's the same route as it was last year. Is that correct? Awesome. Okay. Um, that's really exciting. Okay, the next, um, I guess we'll call it committee or subgroup, methanol engines in Alaska. JR, any updates there? Any, you know, progress or further obstacles or uh, things to share with the group there? Yeah, I'll, I'll just keep this brief, uh, but, but maybe recap just slightly since we have some new people on online. Um, 
you know, and I, I was thinking about this just as we we had the the main presentation from from uh, Iceland. It does seem like, you know, uh, I I wish it were going to be a problem in the near future about being able to get CO two, but I, I think that you know that that's probably a a problem well down the road uh, to be able to access uh, CO two that needs uh, something better done with it than than going into the atmosphere uh, and uh, given. You know, the um, there's still some things that need to be worked out, I think, with a lot of the, uh, you know, other fuels like ammonia before they become truly practical. Uh, so that's one of the things why we've been focusing on, you know, trying to see, hey, you know, methanol, you know, is is pretty well, you know, ready to go technologically. Um, you know, we, we can buy a methanol engine and deploy it. Uh, and, and it would be actually, you know, not just environmentally uh, on a whole host of metrics, but also economically advantaged in at least some parts of the state. So um, we've been trying to figure out how it becomes legal to bring an engine into the state and uh, continue to hit, you know, the kind of this barrier of um, trying to get past the EPA approval process when it's very expensive and there's no real pot of gold for an engine manufacturer uh, it, it is to do so at this point. Um, we're, we're, you know, continuing to, to kind of wrestle with it. But, uh, you know, Ali Eskema actually has been, has had a lot of good news in terms of our project development, which has been keeping us very busy <laughs> on, on trying to get the plant built uh, also. But, I, I you know, we, we remain really... Um, interested in you know any any you know thoughts or or assistance that the the group can offer on how uh, possibly one one um we might uh, start getting some uh so make some progress on on bringing an engine in for at least a testing basis okay thank you jr mike did do you have something you wanted to say in response to jr yeah jr we we are dealing with a uh, a mining operation here in fairbanks that's going to be trucking or in Fairbanks, and there's been some environmental concerns brought up with respect to that. But one of the side effects of that has been that the uh, it's it's come out that the the highway emissions, the emissions for traffic and the emissions for motors, is 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 kind of a a formula that's already been worked, and there doesn't seem to be any additional regulation there controlling those emissions. So like, for example, if uh, the state of Alaska has a permit for X amount of emissions based on a highway system. So I wonder how your, your motor might fit into those to that category and you might be able to avoid some of that special permits that you might be thinking you need. Yeah, thanks for that. So the, the problem actually isn't the emissions um, per se. The methanol engines are cleaner. <clears throat> That's one of the advantages uh, of uh, they they don't just cut CO two they cut you know a, a host of criteria pollutants and then they don't you know contaminate groundwater the same way that that hydrocarbons do. Um, the problem is that EPA needs to certify any engine that's imported for sale in the United States, and they don't really know how to deal with methanol engines very well. And so when you're we, we so we've identified you know, European manufacturers uh, of methanol engines who would like to export them to the U.S. We've dealt with uh, Canadians who would like to package those engines with generators. Um, and then we have people, for example, on the North Slope who would be interested in using them if we could bring that, that generator and engine package up to the slope. But the problem is that they can't be legally imported into the U.S. without a multi-year. And, you know, we're hearing about a million dollar plus um process of, of going through the EPA uh, approval, which would allow that engine to be report, imported for resale in the U.S. And so, uh, and, and then the, so then we have to turn around and ask the engine manufacturer, will you go through this process? And they'll be like, do you have a million dollars to offset our expenses with EPA? And I look in both pockets and I say, not today. Uh, so either we need some some funding or some help from somebody to Kind of grease these things through EPA on an experimental basis, or, or something. I, I but to really cut this knot. Okay, thanks, Jr. Um, if you didn't buy the engine here and it just came in to be used, is that allowed? That's my super naive question, without knowing anything about import export regulations. Uh, no. 
Okay. <laughs> All right. Brian. Yeah, I, I understand that EPA is probably going to want to do crash tests on the fuel cell, fuel lines, et cetera, et cetera, how it impacts other vehicles. Um, but what about small boats like jet boats um, that is used as uh, primary transport for the riverine communities, uh, fishermen and well, yeah, you bring up an excellent application because, you know, because methanol doesn't create slicks on the water and is like a 60,000th as toxic to marine life or as gasoline or whatever. It's a great boat fuel. Plus, it runs really well in an engine, like gives you a big octane boost. Um, but the, uh, the, the EPA problem isn't like a highway safety problem of how a car is designed. It's actually each individual engine needs to be approved by the EPA before it can be sold. So like we, we, the ones we were looking at specifically were stationary engines. So it would be, a, you know, a large engine that you could run a power generator or a, a, a drill rig or something off of. Um, but uh, it's kind of that, that wall is, the, you know, getting that special approval for that engine to be able to be used in the U.S. Okay. Thank you, JR. Anything else? Michael? Um, yeah, I just wanted to kind of elaborate on what JR had mentioned. So I work for a MTU Rolls-Royce engine distributor. Um, they're currently in the development of a 100% uh, hydrogen fueled engine um, with a native uh, hydrogen fuel system by uh, 2030. Um, but they are also working on development of uh, methanol and uh, potentially ammonia fuel systems. Um, but long story short, the next couple of weeks, I'm going to be in Europe at the factories where they're, I'm going to be at the Spark Ignited Engine factory where they're working on the hydrogen uh, fueled engine. I'm going to be working with them and try to ask them questions about, you know, their developments on methanol fueled engines and what it might take from their end to uh, help us try to get one of these engines in the US and to be able to operate it legally. So I've kind of been working with the M2 Rolls-Royce uh, Marine side because they're currently in development of a, a methanol propulsion engine. So JR, I, I haven't given up. I'm still trying to work this and try to figure it out. You're amazing and I love you. <laughs> so while I'm in Europe too, uh, M2 Rolls-Royce is uh, uh, working on uh, finishing the development of their hydrogen fuel cell and their hydrogen electrolyzer. So I'll get uh, status updates on those. So if, if you guys have any questions or anything that you want me to take to the factory and try to get um, you know technical questions answered regarding any of that stuff, just uh, feel free to uh, reach out to me. Thank you. Thank you. I'm really excited to hear what you find out. Great. This is exactly, these are exactly the types of exchanges this working group is for. So that's terrific. Anything else for JR there on methanol engines? Okay. We've got about 15 minutes late uh, left. <laughs> We're not late. Uh, any other um, topical updates from anyone else on the call? Um, breakthroughs, challenges, developments, events. We'd like them to relate to hydrogen. Um, I see a hand up, so I'm gonna let Bill take it away. I wanted to report uh, last week, there was a uh, challenge team meeting for the Pacific Northwest Hydrogen Hub. Those of us on the advisory committee were able to look under the hood for hey, the Bill? first time. Bill? Yes. Bill, you signed a confidentiality agreement about those meetings. That's not to be shared outside of those rooms. Yes. Thank yes, you. Yes, and I want I, and I wanted to say that it was confidential, and so I can't okay. report anything about it. Okay. Should thank I, you. Should I say no more? Yes, please. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thanks for your advice. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay. Any other topical updates? Hydrogen related from Aaron, anyone Tim else here. on the call? Aaron, Tim here with um, the notice of intent uh, that some of you I'm sure have already seen from uh, DOE. This is on the Vehicle Technology Office program-wide funding opportunity announcement that is expected to drop sometime this month, I think. 
Uh, one of the areas of interest that might leave some room here for hydrogen and some demonstration is the area of interest number 12. Uh, it's an open topic for demonstration and deployment. Uh, I know I've had some thoughts around what could be done to expand uh, the Arctic Road Rally. Obviously, a little narrow focus on that for the moment, um, but you know, expand that into heavier vehicles and alternative uh, energy sources or fuel types. Um, I think it'd be pretty cool to see head-to-head uh, -head comparison of some of these for you know class six, seven, or eight vehicles, uh, some of these different types of, of fuel sources, if we're talking about uh, hydrogen and battery electric, and to see what kind of real world, world performance and comparison uh, we, could, we could make of it. Uh, if folks have some interest in that, uh, you know whether you're uh, associated with uh, an engine manufacturer, as we just heard, um, or if you're talking to you know, some of those who put those engines in those larger vehicles, uh, let me know, and I see a hand up from Elise, perhaps. Go ahead, Elise. No, I just have a separate announcement. I was just getting in the queue. Sorry. Okay. Um, Tim, would you mind putting a link for that FOA in the chat for the benefit of folks on the call? Will do. I realize I could probably look that up too, but I can't do that many things at once. Uh, <laughs> great, that's wonderful. So you're looking for partners in a submission to that FOA. Is that correct, Tim? Yeah, if anyone has interest in the partner role or even if they have a particular lead, let me know and I'll put my contact in the chat as well. Okay, topic area 12? Yes. Okay, great, great. Um, all right, Elise, you are up. Okay, uh, you brought up FOA. So I wanted to uh, uh, um, share a FOA that's coming out. Uh, we're here in the middle of February. Uh, NREL is providing uh, the technical assistance portion of Bill 40209, which is for small and medium manufacturers transitioning to clean energy product lines. And, and hydrogen definitely fits really nicely in this space. Um, if anyone just Google Bill 40209, it's being released by the Manufacturing and Energy Supply Chain Office at DOE. And um, feel free to reach out to me if you want to talk more about it. Terrific. And do you have a link uh, for more information you can put in the chat there and then we can add it to the notes? I sure will. Yep. Thanks. Thank you, Elise. Um, any other updates from the group that are hydrogen related? I have a question. Yep. Go um, ahead, Brian. Um, if anyone in this group, could you guys message me? If you know of anyone using uh, hydropower to produce hydrogen um, and using uh, piezoelectric, static electric, or triboelectric technologies, I'd be interested. Okay. Thank you for that. Other updates? Going once, going twice. I think that's a wrap, folks. All right, if there are no other announcements for the good of the group, we are going to wrap things up here easily by 1 p.m. Alaska time. We are tentatively planning on our next meeting on Tuesday, March 7th, uh, and we have a tentative commitment from Kirk Waltz um, from ABS to talk about uh, the, a green shipping corridor um, concept that they have that they're developing. And uh, as always, please reach out to us if you've got something you want to see discussed. Um, if you've got questions, if you think there's a topic we should um, concentrate on. That meeting will be at uh, 11.30 Alaska time, just like this one is. We're going to continue with the first Tuesday of the month. Um, I know last fall we talked about doing something in person. Uh, Patty and I will talk about whether we can pull that off for March or maybe we're, we're looking forward to April at this point. Um, we, we will keep you all posted. Um, you know, the pandemic has not seemed to be too bad up here uh, this winter. so. 
here's hoping maybe we can pull off something in person at some point. Um, I will leave it at that. Again, any other announcements for the good of the group? Patty, have I forgotten anything? Nope, thank you. Okay. All right, well, in that case, we will let you all go. Thank you so much for your participation. Thanks again to our uh, presenter, Jan Bjorn. Thank you all for your questions and discussion. Uh, and we will see you all in a month, if not earlier, for various uh, breakout sessions. So have a great day. Take care. <laughs>